Hello everyone! In this tutorial I'll be showing you how to animate walk cycle in Cascadeur in a quick and easy way. By following these few simple steps you'll get an animation similar to this one. So let's begin. For this animation I'm going to use a sample scene with the Unreal 5 character. You can use the same character or any other humanoid that is compatible with the auto posing tool. Let's adjust the way the character is shown in the viewport to make the process of setting up poses as convenient as possible. I like to view the character from several angles at once. Press the spacebar and you'll get two viewports. Click the center of the view cube to switch to the isometric mode. In the isometric mode there are no perspective distortions, meaning the image is flat like a blueprint. Now we need to snap the character to a coordinate axis. Click the colored points around the view cube. In this viewport, I want to see the character from the front, while in this one, I want to see them from the side. Also notice that the grid appears when you switch to the isometric mode. I'll enable the auto posing mode for both viewports. Now we can start setting up the first pose. As the character is supposed to look forward in this animation, it would be better to activate direction controllers for the head and the torso right at the beginning. Just select the direction controller points for the head and press Shift Z. The activated point is colored blue. Now the character's head will always be facing forward. Same way, I will activate the direction controller for the torso. After this, we can set up the legs. First of all, move the feet a bit closer together. Oftentimes, decreasing the space between the feet results in a more fluid walk. So the first pose is a contact pose. In this pose, one of the legs is moved forward and the other one is left behind. Notice how the auto posing tool has automatically positioned the arms. When the right leg is at the front, the right arm would be at the back and vice versa. Now let's adjust the feet. The front leg stands on its heel. The other one is raised on its toes a bit. Simply drag the big point of the foot up a bit. Once this is done, let's move on to the pelvis. As the right leg is at the front, the pelvis is rotated to the right a bit. The torso, on the other hand, is rotated to the left. Now you can make some adjustments to the torso's general position and tilt angle. A convenient way to do this is by selecting the points at the neck and the pelvis. Hold control to decrease the effects of the manipulator. This way you'll be able to make more precise adjustments of the body position. And the contact pose is done. So let's sum up the most important things about this pose. Both legs touch the ground, not fully, but with the heel and the toes. The torso and the pelvis are rotated in the opposite directions. When the right leg is at the front, the right arm is at the back and vice versa. We can also move the character's center of mass to the very center to make it more convenient to work with. Select this blue point near the character's pelvis. You'll immediately see a line projecting the center of mass onto the ground. If for some reason you don't see the center of mass point or its projection, right click the edit mode button to check the object visibility settings. Now I can move the entire character and make the center of mass projection line more or less match the start of the coordinate axis on the grid. We don't need pixel perfect precision really. Just move the character to the approximate center of the scene and call it a day. Now we'll immediately add the second contact pose. Set a key at frame 16. You can limit the working area on the timeline down to this key by using this button. Then go to the point controller mode. Select every point in the character. Open the mirror tool menu and set the mirror in plane. My character is oriented along the Z axis. So in my case, X should be the right choice for the mirror in plane. If your character was initially oriented along the X axis, you should use the Z plane instead. Select mirror on the current frame. And as a result, we have two contact poses for one step. Let's add interpolation between them. I choose Bézier. Now we already have something that sort of resembles a step. Now we need to change the interpolation type for the character's arms. 
select the track with the arms. If your scene does not have tracks for various body parts, you can quickly add a new track. Simply select every point in the arms and click this button. So click the title of the track that contains the arms to select every frame on it. Then open this list that contains the types of kinematics and select FK. The arms no longer bend in their elbows and move in a more natural way. Now we can once again fold the track list. Now we can create a new key between the two contact poses. In our case, we'll place this key on frame 8. By the way, you can quickly check how many frames there are between the keys by border selecting them. Here we have 7 frames on each side. So now we need to make a few corrections to the pose in the new keyframe. First, we need to re-enable the auto-posing mode. This leg should be on the ground, while this one should be in the air. Keep in mind that in this pose, you'll need to move the character's torso up a little, so the character won't be walking with their legs half-bent. When we walk in real life, we constantly move up and down a bit with each step. So if we check any point of the body or the head, we should see a wave-like trajectory. We can also make some corrections to the arm's positions in this pose. The arm that moves forward should be completely straightened out. The arm that moves backward could be slightly bent at the elbow. We can also give a very subtle tilt to the character's head and torso in order to make the body look more expressive. Now let's play back our animation. This already looks a lot more like actual walking. Now there's only several finishing touches left to add. Let's create another keyframe between frame 0 and 8. We'll put it on frame 4. On this key, we'll need to make some fixes to the character's feet. The forward leg should already be completely on the ground. Select the point of the foot. Go to the point controller mode and right click the heel point so you could rotate the foot around the heel. However, look at the knee. When I rotate the leg around the heel, the knee straightens and eventually it straightens a little too much, causing the pelvis to move. To avoid that, we'll have to lower the character's body a bit on this key. Press Ctrl Z to undo the changes first, then move the character's body down a bit so that the knee would bend slightly. Then finally I can place the foot on the ground so that the leg would be straightened with the pelvis point remaining in place. Now we are done with this leg. At the moment however, the other leg doesn't move quite right. Notice how it starts to move forwards right away, but really, on this key it should be going further backward. Enable Ghosts and select the Neighbor Frame mode. You also need to click this key icon, so it will only show ghosts for the keyframes. Now I'm able to see where the leg was in the previous key and where it will be in the next one. This will give me a better understanding of how I should move the leg on the current keyframe. First, let's rotate the foot. Select every point of the foot and right click the toe point. Now you can rotate the foot around that point. In this frame, the foot barely touches the ground. Now we need to select every foot point and move them backward. As we do this, the leg would straighten at the knee. Additionally, pay attention to the arms. Autoposing has automatically positioned them in a way that makes the hands move further than on the previous key, which is exactly what we want in our case, as it gives the arms a bit of an overlap. And now what's left to do is the final key on frame 12. In fact, the pose in that key already looks good enough, so I'll just make some adjustments to the leg. Make sure that the back foot is slightly on its toe. You can also move the character's body up a bit to straighten the leg at the knee. By the way, I don't recommend making the legs completely straight though. They should be slightly bent still. And so we have every key pose we need for a single step. You can play the animation in the silhouette mode. As the second step is identical to the first one, it would be easy to imagine what the complete animation would look like. Now we'll complete the cycle by creating the second step. Before doing that, however, we should check all the main trajectories and make sure that nothing's wrong with the first one. Click one of the points and select several frames on the timeline. 
and you should see the motion trajectory for the frames you've selected. The closer the points are to one another, the lower the velocity on this interval is. Bigger distances mean faster movement. Make sure that the trajectories for the arms are shaped like arcs, with even acceleration in the middle. The trajectory for the leg making a step looks like some kind of a raindrop. Alright, these trajectories look fine to me. Now it's time to create keys for the second leg. First, we'll need to expand the working area on the timeline. Then use the border to select every key we've already created. Hold shift in the mouse wheel, and then drag the frame so that the first key would end up on frame 16. Now I need to mirror these frames. Select the entire second step and open the mirror tool panel. Set the mirror in plane, and click mirror on interval. The frames are mirrored, but the interpolation between the frames has been changed to fixed, and we don't need that. For now I'll undo the mirroring and reset everything to how it was. This button defines whether interpolation switches to fixed when certain tools are applied. We'll need to disable it first. Now I can mirror the interval. Alright, finally we have two steps. For our next step, we can apply physics corrections to our animation. Enable the physics ghost with this button. Let's take a look at our animation. As we can see, the physics ghost jumps on certain intervals. Such intervals are marked orange in the timeline. The reason Cascadeau renders those intervals as jumps is because of the fulcrum points. If you switch to the point controller mode, you will see green patches around points of the feet. These are fulcrum areas. Now I'll give you a short example of how they work. Let's take a scene with a character just standing there. Every key is the same. There's a big fulcrum area around the feet. If I raise the character's foot on this frame, the fulcrum area will get smaller and eventually disappear. Now the fulcrum area is gone on the entire interval between the keyframes, where the foot leaves the ground but it is still present on the next intervals as the foot there is once again back on the ground. The same will happen if I move the leg sideways. Points of the foot have certain values to limit maximum distance when a point is moved or raised above the ground. The second the actual distance exceeds these values, the point is no longer recognized as fulcrum. And this is exactly what happens in our walking animation. Thus, you could say that at the moment, autophysics is not able to work with stay in place types of animation. In reality, though, we could still use autophysics with this animation if we just increase that maximum distance value for the feet. However, I should mention that there's no guarantee this method would work with every single animation. For walk cycles, though, it often shows surprisingly decent results. Now select every point of the feet. Then select every frame of the animation. Turn on this button. When enabled, changes you make are applied to every selected frame. Now open the fulcrum point tab and increase the max distance value. I'll set it to 15. Check the fulcrum areas in the viewport and the autophysics stripe on the timeline. On frames 0 to 4, both legs touch the ground, and the stripe appears green. Then, one of the feet leaves the ground, and only the other one continues to support the character. The stripe there is yellow. If on these frames you have the foot still touching the ground, you can fix that by moving the foot up. Or you can enable the Not Fulcrum button for that foot. To make this value work on the whole interval, it should be turned on on this key and on the previous one. The same goes for the second step. Once again, both legs touch the ground, then only one continues to act as a fulcrum. And so, what has autophysics done with this animation? At first sight, it might be difficult to notice any significant differences. Click this button to place the physics ghost over the character mesh. This way, the changes made will stand out more. 
Now we can see how with every step Autophysics shifts the character a little in the direction of the supporting leg. It also adds a slight back and forth motion to the character's body. And this is exactly what happens when we walk in real life. Which sort of means Autophysics has brought a bit of life to our animation. It might not be too obvious with a standard issue walking animation. But if you try to make less conventional kinds of walking, such changes would be far more noticeable. Sometimes, however, things may not go as smoothly. For example, you could run into a problem when, for some reason, Autophysics rotates the character's pelvis. This happens because, when it tries to straighten the torso, the fulcrum leg stretches too far. There are several ways to deal with a problem like this. The best one would be to move the character's body down a little. Then, this problem should disappear. Alternatively, you can go to the key where the issue is most apparent and click this button. That frame will be recognized by Autophysics as having maximum priority, which means the Autophysics ghost will try to completely replicate the character's pose on that frame. This, however, might not be achieved by altering poses on other frames which is not always what we want. We can also apply Autophysics as is, and then adjust the pelvis manually. Another problem that we might encounter is when the character tilts heavily in one direction, but does not tilt nearly as much in the opposite one, meaning the motion won't be completely symmetrical. If this becomes very noticeable and impedes your animation, you can simply snap Autophysics to one step and then copy and mirror this step. In my case though, everything seems fine. So I'll simply click the snap button and turn Autophysics off. And so our animation is all but complete. There's one more thing left to do. The animation is not cycled yet. What that means is that the last frame does not smoothly transition into the first one. Velocities go through slowdowns in the beginning and at the end of the animation, as if stopping every time the animation is played. So let's turn our animation into a cycle. To do so, select every frame of the animation except for the very last key, the one which is an exact copy of the first one. Now click the Create Cycle button. A pink border should appear around the frames. The first frame will become the final frame of this cycle. Thus the key at frame 32 we no longer need. You can delete it or you can simply shrink the available part of the timeline to leave it outside the working area. Now that we have all the keys we need, the cycle is finally closed. All that's left to do is to clean this animation up and polish it a bit. Check the trajectories for various body parts. It's usually better to start with the feet and make your way up step by step. I'll select the foot point and the frames where I'd like to see its trajectory. Then I can fix the visualization for the trajectory on these frames. We need to monitor the foot to make sure it doesn't get stuck anywhere or accelerate or decelerate too sudden or too much. The speed of a leg movement should be more or less constant. You can change trajectories by moving object on different keys. You should also check the arm trajectories. Play the animation to see if there's still anything that you might want to improve. And finally, if you think the animation is good enough, that means it's complete. You can export the final animation to use it in your projects. Just don't forget that you only need to export the cycle itself without the final keyframe. And that's it. We hope you found this tutorial useful. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below or in our Discord channel. Thanks for watching.